بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars, elders, brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Allah سبحانه وتعالى says in his holy Quran in verse 169 of the third chapter in the Quran of Al Imran stating do not say about those who die in the path of Allah as dead nay they are alive with their Lord and receiving blessings inshallah that will be the topic for tonight the idea and concept of the martyrs in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we're going to talk about this particular issue inshallah in three particular stages because of the shortness of time for tonight, inshallah, first and foremost, I'd like to talk about the idea of martyrdom. In the first instance of where we would like to look at the concept of Sakaratul Maut. We want to look at the idea of Sakaratul Maut, the pain that they will face in Sakaratul Maut or the ease that you will face in Sakaratul Maut in reference to a particular article. Secondly, we'd like to look at the relationship between man and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we want to analyze the idea of loving for the sake of Allah and loving for any other particular sake. And seeing the differences and looking at the martyrs and giving them the rank that they deserve. After we analyze why and how they've given up for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the third and final point for tonight, inshallah, we'd like to look at the two scales. One of which being quantity and the other being quality. In the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the battles that have been fought in Islam, to give you an idea of the quality that we had versus the times when we had quantity and the difference that it made in particular battles. So inshallah, to start the topic of tonight, please help me in reciting aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. When Isa, we find that Isa, when he brings his mother, Sayyida Maryam, back, what is the first thing that she says? Because Isa is thinking, you know what, Allah has given me this ability to bring back life. Sayyida Maryam replies to him by saying, he says, she says, what have you done, my son? He says, are you not happy that I brought you back to life? She says, oh son, the taste of Sakaratul Maut has still not left my tongue. Giving us an idea of what? That there are Mu'mineen, high ranks, some of which do what? Feel Sakaratul Maut, some don't. What's the idea behind this? What's the jurisprudential argument behind this? What's the theory? He says in this particular article, he says, he says, look at the justice of Allah. He says, the Mu'mineen, he says, some don't have a sin. Some of the Mu'mineen are close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he chose not to Make them feel Sakaratul Maut. He says, others, look at the justice of Allah. He says, I make them feel Sakaratul Maut. Mu'mineen, Muslimin. He says, I make them feel Sakaratul Maut. Why? He says, in order when they go to the day of judgment, they do not have to attain a punishment because they've already been punished for their sins. Straight away, they go towards the heaven. Let's look at the reverse angle. The kuffar. This is the same incident. He says the kuffar, some of them feel Sakaratul Maut, some do not. The people that do not feel Sakaratul Maut, look at the justice of Allah. Obviously, we know the people that do feel it, what they've done in this world. Imagine that they feel it, they're kuffar, they feel Sakaratul Maut and straight towards Malik and Hellfire. Then we find the people that don't find Sakaratul Maut painful of the kuffar. Now the idea behind this is what? Is there are many of the, of the kuffar that do what? That have done greatness in their lives. They've helped people. They've done good things. 
What is their punishment in the day of judgment when we say these guys have done good? Do they go straight towards hellfire? Allah says no. He says, I have given them in reference to what they have done in dunya. I do not let them feel sakaratul maut. He says, therefore, the slate is wiped clean. Everything is accounted for and they go towards the hellfire. Now look at the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's look at it in the reference of a particular companion of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now this is a person where Ali ibn Abi Talib says about him that I have taught him knowledge. When Ali ibn Abi Talib teaches someone knowledge, you think it's like someone, one of us teaching someone else hand me down of knowledge? Ali ibn Abi Talib is the door of the knowledge of the Prophet of Islam. Alamani Rasulullah alfa babin tuftahu min kulli babin alfa bab. One million doors of knowledge if you times it. We find this person is by the name of Rushayd al Hajari. It's known as Rushayd al Manaya wal Balaya as we know him because he had that much knowledge that Ali ibn Talib has instilled in him. Now, Rushayd, he goes in the time where the ruler of Kufa was Abaydullah ibn Ziyad. Rushayd is captured, he's taken towards the court of Abaydullah ibn Ziyad. He says, You're the one that's causing all this disunity between the people. He says, Yes, what's wrong? He says, what has Ali ibn Abi Talib told you about how you're going to die? Because he knew how people were going to die. And we'll look at the story later on tonight. He says, what has Ali told you about how you're going to die? He says, my master Ali ibn Abi Talib has told me that I will die in a manner where you cut off my hands, you'll cut off my legs, and finally you'll cut off my tongue. Abaydullah ibn Ziyad is thinking to himself, well, I'm smarter than Ali ibn Abi Talib. He says, he says, I'm going to make a liar out of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Rashid says, how? He says, watch, I'll cut off your hands and legs and I'll leave your tongue. Therefore, Ali ibn Abi Talib isn't truthful because he said, I'll cut your tongue as well. He cuts his hand and his legs. Now look, look at this character of this particular person. He, later on, what happens is he begins to preach the, the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, the knowledge of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Until what? Until a time where Abaydullah ibn Ziyad says, go and cut his tongue off before he brings more followers to the school of Ahlul Bayt. Salla ala Muhammad. But the narration I want to take from this story is when he is about to leave the palace. Remember, he hasn't cut his tongue off yet. He's cut his hands and his legs. His daughter is carrying his limbs as they exit the castle or the palace. When they're exiting, the daughter looks at her father, Rashid. She asks him, look at this question, brothers and sisters, to analyze Sakaratul Maut, to analyze the pain instilled, and to analyze the love someone has between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the feeling of pain. She asks him, she says, what do you feel at this particular moment, O oh father? What do you feel at this particular moment? You've just had your hands and, le and legs cut off. He says, it's as if I'm squashed. Look at the reply of this man. He says, as if I'm squashed between a gathering or between a large crowd. You think to yourself, he's not feeling any pain. He's not feeling the utmost pain, unbearable pain. We would. Why is it that Rashid didn't feel it? All that he could feel is as if he's in a gathering or a large crowd. Imam al-Baqir has a statement, and this is the one I want to focus on tonight. Imam al-Baqir says something about the companions of Abu Abdullah. He says, know that the companions of my grandfather, Hussein ibn Ali, did not feel the pain of the iron hit them. Let's look at this narration, not on a literal level, because in a literal level, there's no merits. If you don't feel any pain, what's the use of you going towards the war? What's, what's the merit in it? How can we say that these were great, great fighters? Me, if I don't feel any pain, you put me through anything, I say, you know what, I don't have a fear of the pain itself. But Imam al-Baqir says this in an analogy that he wants to give us. When he says, Inna ashab jaddi al Hussein, lam yajidu alam mas al hadid People take this in a metaphorical level. That's why we have to look at it. I'll give you an analogy. The first analogy I want to give you is a story about a... A young man that was in love with a particular woman, or his crush, let's say. 
This man was known as Jamil. He, he was sitting down and he had an arrow in his hand. And you know, when you sharpen the arrow, it's quite dangerous. And his crush comes in. Her name was Buthayna. And then he's carving the arrowhead. She comes in. He's talking to her for moments. Moments. And when she leaves, he begins to realize that instead of the arrow, he's actually cutting his finger off. Did he feel the pain? He didn't. Let's see in the second instance. In the Quran, it gives us the same analogy. In the Quran, in Surah Yusuf, in the sign 31 or ayah 31, what do we see? When Zulaikha puts Yusuf inside and she brings the woman, when she brings the woman in and she gives each one a knife and she gives them fruit and then she says what? She tells Yusuf, come in. What, what does the ayah say? What? Isn't it? And they cut their hands. They didn't realize they cut their hands. Why? Because they were mesmerized by Yusuf's beauty, isn't it? They didn't have any realization. The pain of cutting their hands wasn't there. Now let's look at this on a materialistic level. This was a crush between a man and the opposite gender. Now let's look at it at the love someone has between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Imam al-Baqir says about the companions of Aba Abdullah, they did not find the pain of the iron striking them. Is it talking about a materialistic love? Or is it talking about a love between a man and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Imagine the level of elevation that these people had. When Ali ibn Abi Talib was known to have an arrow in his leg, when did they tell him to take the arrow out of his leg? When he's in salah. When he's in a connection between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the essence of tonight, brothers and sisters. When we commemorate the shuhada, do you think it's easy when we think about the shuhada? These men left everything behind them. Their families, their wives, their children, their mothers, their fathers. When we see clips about a man saying goodbye to his mother for the last time and going towards the battlefield. We see, how many videos do we see of this? And we think to ourselves, wow, it's such an emotional position that the mother is in. There's such an emotional position that the boy is in. But we know not of the character of such a person that has made the commitment to leave everything behind. What kind of ideology must this person have to say that I have now come to a conclusion where I see only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the love I have for Allah is greater than any other for this particular dunya. Sallu ala Muhammad wa This is the essence, brothers and sisters, of the love between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you and materialistic level with the opposite gender, with materialistic things. Now let's look at the shuhada. Let's look at people that went on to become shuhada. Let's look at the idea of quantity versus quality. The first idea is quantity. Let's look at quantity. In quantity, we see that the first battle of Islam, how many people did we have? 313 in the Prophet's time. 313 warriors. They defeated close to 1,000. In narrations, there we have 950. Nearly three times their number. But 313 what? solid on the Iman, the first people to come and join the Prophet of Islam. We see the last battle of Islam with and alongside the Prophet is the, known as the Battle of Hunayn, isn't it? Battle of Hunayn, what do we know about it? 12,000, weren't we? The Muslims, we were 12,000 against an army which was in narrations from five to six, half of us. What happens then? To give you an idea who, who joined Islam and what they represented and how they defended Islam. 12,000 the Prophet split them, half to Ali ibn Abi Talib and half to Khalid ibn al-Walid. Ali tells Khalid, he says, don't go between the valley because they are waiting for you with their boulders and fire. So Khalid goes through the valley. And then you find them attacking them. The Muslims begin to run away. Both sides of the 6,000, they see the Muslims fleeing and everyone joins the caravan. The Prophet's left with eight people. 12,000 Muslims, the prophets left with eight people defending him. Where is, the, where is the numbers here? Where is the quantity here? We only had 
eight people that were ready to defend the Prophet of Islam. Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says to the people that came to his doorstep and they said, why don't you fight for the Khilafah? Why don't you go and get your right back? The Prophet said, this is yours. Ali ibn Abi Talib replies such a beautiful way, he replies. He says, I want only people that want to take the Khilafah to come here tomorrow. If there's 40, I will go and bring my right back. How many people turned up the next day? How many? Handful, brothers and sisters. One even came late. Handful. This is, this is the, the, the quantity that we have. When Imam Sahib al-Asri was Zaman, he says, I only need 313 of the most elite. It's quality, it's not quantity. Quality warriors, quality people that do not even think about sinning against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the quality that he's looking for, that people will possess. And until that time, then the Imam Sahib al-Asr wa Zaman will come. Because when do we see the quality of the shuhada, such as the quality of the shuhada that we had on the 10th of Muharram? When we look at Zuhair ibn al-Qayyim, and he goes up to the Imam of his time, Imam al Hussein alayhi afdal salati wa salam, and he says, Oh, my Imam. He says, I want to tell you that if I am killed, then I am reborn and killed and reborn and killed and reborn and it happens to me a thousand times and I suffer through all that pain knowing that Allah will take away the calamities from you and your household then I will happily do it this is the shuhada this is the characters that the Imam says there is no companions like mine no companions like my companions when Habib ibn Mudahir is found smiling Habib ibn Mudahir is found smiling on the 10th of Muharram. People look at him and says, what are you doing? There's 30,000 odd people waiting for their swords to be quenched with blood. And you're here smiling? He says, why is it that I do not smile? Knowing that I am going to die on the truth. Knowing that from here, he says, that a few swords will sway towards us and then the next moment we'll find ourselves next to the Hur. That's Habib ibn Mudahir. Habib ibn Mudahir, look at him and look at his family. Let's take these in, into consideration. When they came back towards Kufa, his, his wife tells their son Qasim. She tells them, I have found that the Sabaya have entered Kufa. Go and see if your father stood firm on the religion or if your father did not. If he stood firm, then be proud and say that I am the son of Habib ibn Mudahir. And if, look, look at the raising of this child. It says, and if he was not in favor of Hussein, and he did not stand firm for Hussein, then make sure you dissociate yourself. A mother's telling Qasim to go. Habib ibn Mudahir is not a normal person, brothers and sisters. If the Imam says he's a faqih, that means he's, he's like a marja in our terms, let's say. This is Habib ibn Mudahir. He goes towards the market. Habib ibn Mudahir, that particular person, his head wasn't put on a spear. Habib ibn Mudahir wasn't put on a spear. Habib ibn Mudahir, what did they do with his head? They took two locks of his hair and they tied it to a horse. So when the horse's head was down, Habib ibn Mudahir's face would scrape on the floor. And when the horse was galloping, the head of Habib ibn Mudahir would be hitting the knees of the horse. Qasim goes towards the marketplace. He goes towards Kufa. And he comes back. And he says, Mother. He says, Why are you happy? He says, Mother, I am happy because I saw the head of my father. He says, I am happy because I saw the head of my father while tied to a horse and the horse's knees hitting my father's head. And he had a smile on his face, brothers and sisters. Like we say it now and we think to ourselves, what kind of tragedy was this? He had a smile on his face. That's Habib ibn Mudahir. This guy also knew his ends. When he had a talk with Maytham al Tamar, Maytham tells him how you, he is going to die. And he tells Maytham how he is going to die. These are the companions of the greatest of our Imams. These are the companions that we should aim to be towards. And these are the people that we look towards, that's the people that, these people that we commemorate tonight, the shuhada, 
of Hashd al-Shaabi, the shuhada that defended the religion of Islam upon a request. And they gathered to defend and to say, you know what, whatever you say, we will follow. These are the people that we commemorate tonight. At the end of the narration between Rushaid al-Hajri and his daughter, she asks him because he thought that what? It was not of any pain. What did we say? We say when she asked him, how is it? How does the pain feel to have your legs and hand chopped off? What does he say? It's as if I'm between a crowd, isn't it? She replies by saying, the daughter replies by saying, oh my father, how great your piety is. Look at the reply of the father. The father says, you think my piety is great? She says, yes. He says, I know of a time or of a qawm that will come at the end of time. He says, at the end of time, there will come people where their piety on their religion and their steadfastness on their religion is greater than mine. That's talking about you and I, brothers and sisters. Every single angle we're attacked. What did we say last week? We said that in the Quran it's mentioned as Zulaikha. We have a thousand Zulaikhas nowadays. In the Quran it's mentioned a Pharaoh. How many Pharaohs do we have nowadays? In the Quran it gives us analogies, but it's multiplied nowadays. This is why it's the end of time. This is why we don't even see our Imam. But look at how we act. Look at how much we come towards the mosques, how much we learn about religion, and how much we crave for the reappearance of our Imam, Imam Sahib al Asri wa Zaman. Now we say this, inshallah, and I end for tonight and give a chance for our other reciters and our D Sheikh to come on the pulpit and give us from his wisdom. And inshallah, we pray for the blessings and for the rahmah of the shuhada that have passed, whether it be from Hajj al-Shaabi, whether it be from the two people that lost their lives defending a mosque, Baytun in Biyutillah, defending it in Saudi Arabia, whether it be any shaheed have died for the path of Ahlul Bayt, when the shaheed that died firm on this particular path, we want to gift them the blessing of Surah al mubarakah Al-Fatiha, but before it, three of your loudest salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.